Watching bears at Brooks River is a unique experience. We watch bears closely throughout the summer, not only recognizing them by their physical characteristics, but also by their behaviors. And across seasons and years, we get to see how they grow and mature, how they change their ways of making a living when necessary, and how they expose their cubs to lessons they can utilize later in life. On a larger scale, we're witness to a unique concentration of bears at a waterfall. They have developed a salmon-centered culture and have found success through their ability to adapt and transmit information from one generation to the next. Hi everyone, I'm Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. And welcome to this live chat brought to you by explore.org, Katmai National Park and the Katmai Conservancy. Individual and cultural differences help brown bears utilize their intelligence, their individuality and adaptability to survive not only within Katmai but across a wide swath of the earth. And to help us learn more about this, I'm joined by my co-host today, park ranger Kim Grossman from Katmai National Park. Kim, it looks like you have another great day to be outside talking about brown bears. Absolutely. It's a beautiful day outside and we have some bears that are joining us for this chat out in the background. So hopefully you'll see some of them swimming around. Yeah, so Kim is standing on a wildlife viewing platform at the mouth of Brooks River. I am at my home studio, really just sitting in front of my TV, if you want to call it that. But uh, we have, of course, a lot to, of ground to cover today about bear personalities and bear culture. If you have questions about that topic as we head along, drop those in the chat and we'll do our best to try to answer at least a few of those during the during the main part of the program. And especially we'll try to get to a few after um, or, or towards the end of our conversation today. Kim, perhaps because many Western philosophers and institutions once denied agency and sentience to animals, Western science was really slow to acknowledge the role of culture and personality in non-human creatures. Thankfully, that tide is turning, uh, but can you begin uh, by maybe helping us understanding culture a little bit more? How do you define culture and, and personality and how is that applicable to bears? Sure. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and define culture first. Um, culture is everything that is learned from others and then is repeatedly transmitted to the following generations. So think of it as a sort of mix between tradition and perhaps the conventions of one specific society. So if one were to move locations, for example, and then join a different community, uh, their culture would likely also shift or rather it would meld into a new environment. So personality, on the other hand, is a little bit more individualistic and subsistent throughout one's life, though it too is not without outside influence. Uh, various personality tests exist for people to help understand themselves, but just as we find that with humans, it is impossible to place any individual into a perfectly packaged box. The same thing goes with bears. So there are qualities we can observe and we can assess where an individual may fall on a sliding spectrum. Uh, the five qualities we will be looking at for bears are the levels of boldness, activity, exploration, aggressiveness, and their sociability. These personality traits affect how the bears coexist amongst each other and the landscape and with all of us humans as well. So as Mike mentioned before, the culture we witness our brown bears thriving in at Brooks Camp is one that revolves around salmon and the river itself. But not all of Katmai bears end up here at Brooks River, which is interesting. Uh, many of the Katmai bear population lives out an entirely different culture on the coast. So meanwhile, other bears like grizzlies or black bears in other areas of the country are also innovating their own cultures. Ooh. As we develop uh, further into this topic, we will unravel how you know nature versus nurture plays a role in both bear culture and the personality, but also how diversity is also vital for generational growth. Mike, you know, as we begin our exploration on culture, it would be great if you could tell us what perhaps it looks like in other animals and maybe in the human species as well. Yeah, let's take a look at 
how culture maybe uh, is transmitted in people. Uh, you know, people transmit culture through just our experiences, interacting with other people. Uh, we have the ability to uh, transmit culture through books and television and other mass media, uh, through our social and family expectations, our, our norms in those situations and our obligations. And culture is learned. I think that's a really important point for everyone to consider as we're thinking about how bears have culture and how they transmit culture. So culture is learned, it influences and shapes behavior, and it's often unconscious. We usually don't think about how our behaviors and attitudes have been shaped by culture. I think one example that always pops into my mind when, I, when I'm considering this, and I don't know why it's this one, but it just is, is how people in North America love to eat crabs, shrimp, and lobster, but insects are just off the menu. You know, we'll eat crustaceans that scavenge dead animals on the seafloor, but we won't touch an insect for some reason. So that's simply a cultural decision. It's not based on logic. It's not based on edibility. It's just what, <laughs> what um, you know, people have decided in the past and it's been passed down from, you know, person to person um, over over time. So uh, cultures evolve. Maybe one day we'll, we'll start to eat more insects. Maybe we won't, who knows? But cultures definitely evolve uh, into a group's collective values and beliefs in their customs and traditions. And I think the latter part, those customs and traditions are really important when we consider what culture means for wildlife. We don't know what their beliefs are, but we can observe their customs for making a living. Orcas, you know, oh, you sometimes will hear them also called killer whales. They're a well-known and relatively well-studied example of this different groups of orcas utilize different dialects they target target different foods they use different habitats along the coast of washington state and british columbia there are different ecotypes that exist next to each other but really never interact their cultural traditions are so strong that they're separate now, two different groups for example the resident orcas and the transient orcas respectively occupy much of the same area in puget sound and farther north into into uh, Queen Charlotte Sound, I think it is, in, in Johnstone Strait in British Columbia. The, the transient orcas prey on marine mammals, while the resident orcas prey on fish, especially salmon. And despite living in the same areas and having the same access to the same foods, these groups of orcas, don't, they don't interact, they don't use the same language, they don't interbreed, they don't fight, they don't hunt the same foods. And these differences exist because socially the whales live in matrilineal groups that consist of closely bonded mothers uh, and, a mo uh, and her offspring. Uh, so these are stable, lifelong associations and cultural traditions are learned and passed down from mother to offspring, such as you know what dialect they're gonna use and the foods they prefer to eat, their hunting methods, etc. Uh, for example, those Northern resident orcas rub their bodies on smooth underwater beaches and the same orca families return to the same rubbing areas again and again. And that's something that mother teaches to their offspring, but it's not transmitted outside of that orca culture. So orcas provide those clear distinctions, I think, between cultures within a single species. But can bears also express culture, although it's perhaps a little less studied? Uh, what's one example that you're familiar with? So yeah, so I've, I've worked in national parks that are home to other species of bears and the cultures of these grizzlies and black bears are just so wildly different from each other. Uh, in Yosemite, for example, the culture of black bears is recovering from decades of improper food storage. So the rangers there since they've been doing, you know, a phenomenal job educating people and both reducing and managing the interactions between humans and the food conditioned bears. Uh, to give you a better idea of what bear culture looks like in Yosemite, uh, back in the 30s, trash was regularly brought out to a central area to lure bears in just for spectator enjoyment. These maladapted bears passed on these habits to their offspring, and bears are intelligent creatures, and they know that gaining calories with the least effort is the most optimal route to take. So. After a bear broke into a blue minivan this one time and scored a huge haul of food, it was reported that it kept breaking into the blue minivans looking for that same payload reward. Uh, a small study that I found supported that minivans were the most broken into vehicles by bears in Yosemite at that time. So these common bouts with humans, uh, human related elements are perhaps why black bears have become more nocturnal in this region. In the Sierras of California, all scented items that have to be taken out of vehicles 
Whereas in other places, it is actually advised to keep all your scented items in a locked vehicle. I think what this says is a lot about bear culture. All bears are highly food-driven creatures, but they react differently despite being of the same species. What alters this behavior? It depends on what opportunities are available to them and what opportunities they are taught. Another, uh, another notable difference in the bears of Yosemite is that they don't fully hibernate in the winter like most bears that we know and we see. As long as they are gaining more energy than they expend, they will take opportunities to forage for more food, whether it's from natural sources like acorns or from sources like human trash that they find. This lack of hibernation is unlike any other bear cultures I've personally seen, and this culture is specific to this particular region of bears. You know, Mike, have you have you witnessed any other interesting bear cultures at other parks when you visited? I think another great example, um, and of course we'll get to Katmai and Brooks River shortly, but another great example is just Yellowstone National Park and the grizzly bears there. So in Yellowstone and the surrounding region, bears there have a, a, a really diverse diet that stands in contrast to other brown bear populations, especially those in Katmai. So many bears in the Yellowstone region seek and rely on large And a unique subset of bears has learned to feed on moths high in the mountains. And this is particularly interesting too, because certain grizzly bears move to talus slopes far above treeline in midsummer to feed on cutworm moths. Only a small portion of the grizzly bear population in these areas use cutworm moths, even though they are a rich and really nutritious food resource. I mean, they probably have about a fat content that's maybe even higher than salmon. So a pound per pound that is. So this is an example of a subculture of bears within a larger bear population. And uh, a, an additional difference, I should say, between grizzlies in Yellowstone and, and throughout much of the Rocky Mountains too, and Katmai's brown bears is that grizzlies uh, in, in Yellowstone and in much of the Rockies, they display a, uh, less tolerance toward each other and toward humans typically. So while there might be a, a genetic component to this, I suspect it's also learned. And it's a learned behavior, uh, that defensiveness, that need for a larger personal space in the past, it probably just helped those bears survive. And I think that's been passed on from generation to generation. So in contrast to, you know, Yosemite's black bears and Yose uh, Yellowstone's grizzlies, now let's, you know, focus more on Brooks River. Uh, we can look at, I think, several immediate differences that stand out when you're looking at Brooks River's bears compared to other bear populations and cultures. Specifically, I think there's three sort of like main things that stand out in my mind, and I'm sure people can think of others. One is that they're highly tolerant of each other. Of course, we, we see, you know, the occasional fight. We frequently see bears jostle for fishing positions, but bears at Brooks River routinely encounter each other at distances less than 50 yards and often within a few feet of one another. Uh, this is a characteristic of, of the bear culture, and that characteristic is overall tolerance. But you, when we're looking at why they're so tolerant of each other, that's really just based on their food culture. So the second part, I think, or the second thing that stands out for them, they're highly focused on salmon. And unlike berries or, you know, sedges that might be dispersed across a landscape, uh, salmon are, you know, not easy to catch. And they're, they're easiest to catch in certain places. So a, a culture of relative tolerance allows Brooks River Spares to exploit an extremely rich, high calorie food source uh, so their food culture has become salmon based in that way. And then lastly, Kim, Brooks Rivers bears are entirely dependent on wild foods. They don't even know that people have food at Brooks Camp, which in itself is wild since trash is burned at Brooks Camp inside of a building that smells like trash, it smells strongly like trash when you're walking by it. And uh, Thing out of it because it just <laughs> because of all the food that they're co they're cooking inside. Yeah, yeah. So it, it is well as you said the the smells are very fragrant <laughs> um, over by camp. So it's it's surprising that the bears don't 
gravitate more to it. Um, they're not really focused on people here at Brooks Camp really at all. Um, as you were saying, wherever there are people, there's going to be smelly areas. So besides the ones that you mentioned, which you cut out a little bit, so I'm not sure if you mentioned these ones, but um, waste bins and, you know, the picnic areas also, you know, a place where people all come together to eat their food sources. Um, but again, we don't see any bears going to these areas and begging for food like we may see at other parks. Um, I remember you mentioned that the lodge always smells like bacon and I can confirm it does. And we see humans flocking there. <laughs> but again, we're not seeing the bears flocking there. So that's great. Um, as part of the Brooks bear culture here, the bears are mostly indifferent towards us. They recognize who we are. They tolerate us in their home, but they are just like laser focused on the abundant salmon resources because that's what they've always known to be a reliable source of calories for their survival, for their ability to hibernate. So perhaps, you know, because of education and adherence to protocols like not carrying food outside, bears do not really associate us at all with food. They are able to maintain a sustainable lifestyle with their preferred foraging methods on the river. And so, you know, with that in mind, what would happen if a bear was taken out of its society and culture and then placed into another where it doesn't know how to find food. For example, what I'm thinking is if we took a Yellowstone bear and then we just dropped it into Katmai or vice versa, what do you think would happen? This is a question that that people will ask us, I think every once in a while. Of course we don't know. I mean, that experiment has never been, um, never been done. And I think it would kind of be unethical to do it anyway. So we'll never really know for sure. Yeah. But I suspect that neither bear would fare well. Uh, I wonder, however, if the Yellowstone bear might adapt a bit more easily to the situation because its habits and culture are more dependent on dispersed foods like plants, for example. A Brooks River bear who is magically transported to Yellowstone might look around and, and wonder just where, where are the fish? Where are the salmon? And mm. what do I do now? So, so much like how, you know, those Southern resident orcas in Puget Sound rely, who rely on salmon are now endangered because they, the only food that they really know and have only learned to target are Chinook salmon runs and Chinook salmon in the region have, you know, their runs have either declined drastically and many of them are extinct uh, already. So the, they're doing poorly, but the transient orcas who feed on marine mammals are doing really well at the moment. Uh, so I think, you know, it, it depends on the bear. But uh, a cat my bear transported out of a salmon region probably would have a much more difficult time making a living. And uh, Kim, this salmon-centered culture of bears is not a spontaneous thing either. We, one thing that we haven't talked about yet is how this culture really is transmitted. So it's due to exposure and learning, particularly, particularly by uh, young bears watching their mother. Yeah. So bears establish their traditions through a mixture of upbringing and social conditioning. So when considering social conditioning, we can simply just observe the dynamic between bears at Brooks Falls. Bears are highly influenced by other bears. We can see that by the existence of the hierarchy alone. We likely wouldn't see, you know, sows teaching their cubs to fish in the jacuzzi. So this is not a trained habit. Yet, as bears become more dominant, they often utilize this area. Bears observe other bears. They see what works, what doesn't, what they can get away with, <laughs> and they mimic successful methods accordingly. A study uh, conducted with monkeys experimented whether offspring would have the same preferences as their parents. Uh, they gave the adults some bitter corn and some sweet corn, and they were just differentiated by color. The monkeys were more inclined to eat the sweet corn, as probably most of us would be, and eventually stopped eating the colored corn they associated with the bitterness. Uh, this experiment with the offspring consisted only of the sweet corn, but in both color options. So they found that the offspring ended up gravitating towards the color their parents had eaten, despite there not being any negative repercussions of bitterness. So. Along with this social learning from what we've seen, bears are greatly shaped by matrilineal influences, kind of like the whales you were talking about earlier. Um, mothers pass on to their offspring, not only foraging location techniques and preferred food options, but 
possibly also habitat preferences, dining styles, and you know, etc. Adaptability to humans is also part of this transmitted culture. So those cells may pass on a culture of special foraging habits, sort of like those Yellowstone bears with the moths. Um, they can also pass on not so great habits, like breaking into cars to access human foods. Um, with bears, it all begins with social conditioning from the mother, and then it's altered by experiences with other bears, like siblings or other bears on the river. And then depending on location, it is modified by, you know, interactions with us humans and our human shaped landscapes. So here at Katmai, we know that female offspring tend to overlap home ranges with their mothers. So this is another way that we see um, matrilineal influences. Um, they learn seasonal movement patterns from them. Um, and at Brooks, we often see strong behavioral similarities between Giselles and their adult children. Isn't that right? Yeah, I think there's a, a really great example of that happening on the river this year. And of course, uh, longtime Bear Camp fans may recognize this example, and they probably can find exceptions to it as well. So again, there's, there's no like, uh, you know, clear cut way that all bears will behave in the same manner. There's always exceptions. But think about number four zero. If you're a longtime Bear Camp fan, you, you may re recognize that that nickname. Uh, Bead Nose, who is shown here, was a very uh, recognizable bear on Brooks River for many years. She brought her cubs to the river. She brought her yearlings to Brooks Falls, and she, uh, she was a prolific angler on the lip of the falls. So this year, we have seen uh, both of her daughters, uh, who are grown now with their own cubs, coming back to Brooks Falls and fishing at the waterfall and even number nine ten this year bringing her uh, her spring cub onto the lip of the falls and fishing there and nine nine zero nine has done that uh, in the past she did that last year maybe not as much this year with her yearling but he's sure she has certainly done that so i think that's a clear example of sort of uh, cultural transmission between one generation to the next and hopefully number nine ten and nine oh nine will raise you know, the healthy, uh, you know, lively offspring that will grow up and maybe have their own, uh, you know, cubs here on the river. And we can see how, you know, that that learning and culture is transmitted down to them. So, you know, it's it's a fascinating process that we get to observe here at Brooks River. That's not an opportunity that most wildlife watching or bear watching destinations offer. And one of the other, you know, fascinating aspects of this is just not like bear culture specifically and how bears learn by watching other bears and learn by the experiences that they're exposed to with their mother, but it's also how their personalities uh, fit into this whole thing. So Kim, you know, how does, how does really personality apply to bears? Yeah, so we, we went over what personality is a little bit earlier, how it's more of an individualized thing, just like every human is very unique. Um, and as one scientist noted, um, he said the higher the diversity, the more the population is able to adapt to uh, changes. So personality differences, they have a great impact on the ecosystem and when we remove any particular trait, um, it can reduce the overall fitness of the species as a whole. Uh, for example, aggression. It may determine territorial boundaries or uh, the, the boldness of an individual may help um, the entire population adapt when changing circumstances happen, like perhaps in the climate. Um, so though we may see patterns in bear behaviors, we do know that personality, qualities, traits, they all fall on a spectrum. Um, let's go ahead and why don't we just take a look at some of our common personality traits we see amongst bears. And then we'll go ahead and we'll highlight a few examples of what those qualities might look like in action. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier there's kind of like five main personality traits that biologists have identified, biologists who are studying, you know, this type of um, aspect of, of wildlife and non-human animals. So those, just to remind everybody, are aggression or aggressiveness, 
uh, exploratory tendency, boldness, sociability, and activity. Those aren't the only ones, mind you. And, and each, importantly, exists on a spectrum. So, you know, consider that when you're watching your bears uh, on, on the cams that, you know, it's, it's a spectrum that, you know, these traits exist within. Uh, so they're not either or qualities of an animal, but just like in people, some individual animals really do showcase these traits more than others. The, the first one that we'll take a look at is aggressiveness. I often like to think of this as almost like assertiveness uh, as well. Uh, this is a, a tendency to have a combative behavior towards others. And for me, the bear that exemplifies this is uh, 856, uh, even among adult males, dominant adult males. He has been the river's most consistently dominant bear during the last 10 years. And by approaching other bears, often without acknowledging their presence, he appears to really expect them to yield space. It's a behavior that suggests confidence. He's also quite willing to engage with other bears and even other very large males to assert his dominance. So engage bears physically when posturing doesn't settle disputes. And he's apparently really good at fighting because once bears tangle with him, they're unlikely to do so again. So I think 856 exemplifies that personality trait in male bears. But Kim, assertiveness isn't limited to just the males. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> so, you know, there's no surprise that I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna talk about 128 Grazer, as I think she exemplifies the quality of assertiveness to a T. So as you see here here in this clip, um, she's she's pretty territorial when it comes to her fishing spot on the lip, and she is extremely protective of her cubs. Many bears settle their conflicts with other bears by just vocalizations and body language, which 128 does sometimes. But on multiple counts, like in this clip, <laughs> I can't get enough of bears falling over waterfalls. We have seen her physically exacerbating, you know, the interaction by shoving the bears off of the waterfall. And next, the, uh, the next trait that we'll, we'll talk about is exploratory tendency. This is, you know, you can think of it more simply as ex exploration and how likely a bear is to do that. This is how individuals really respond to novel situations. Uh, situations do they do they react with hesitation or or might they embrace opportunity uh, when i watch bears i see this a lot in young bears uh, particularly young males and kim you've been watching one young male who seems to display this personality trait all the time you were describing him to me um earlier this week yeah i have been um out on the falls area i've been watching 99 and it just he makes me think of Goldilocks. He's always just giving all of the areas of the river kind of a test try. I've seen him on the lip. He's standing like five feet behind all the bears and watching them fish, but then also trying it, it out himself when he can wiggle his way in. Um, I've seen him taking extended rest breaks on the rock on the far side of the river, just kind of examining the fish situation over there. I've also seen him scavenging for salmon carcasses near the platform. He seems to just be still figuring out his style, but unlike the more timid bears or, you know, the sometimes awkward sub-adults, he seems to be approaching the river with more confidence you know and these more adventurous exploratory tendencies i've seen him everywhere so <laughs> he seems like he's a bear who's not afraid to try everything out at the falls area to figure out where he belongs and our third uh, trait that we'll discuss is sociability so in contrast to aggressiveness sociability is non-combative non-aggressive behavior towards other bears and for me uh over the last several years, the bear that's defined this has been number 503. Throughout his life so far, he's almost always displayed a high tolerance for other bears. He's not often, and, and I should say too, that he's, he's often sought the company of other bears. So it's not only that he's tolerant, but he also shows a willingness to seek out social interactions. 503 frequently uh, solicited play fights when he was a sub-adult bear. Uh, and so, he, and he's the one on the right in this clip here. Uh, and interestingly, he was, he seemed to have the ability to mollify some of the aggressive tendencies of other bears. We've even seen him approach large dominant adult males. And while this didn't always happen, 
they sometimes reacted uh, to him in a, in a relaxed manner. Like they kind of understood, hey, this guy's cool. He's just going to come and hang out. And um, he's not willing to give me a hard time, at least not yet. Uh, but however, you know, 503 sociability might change over time. I, I uh, you know, for example, just to use a, 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 you know, a personal example, I sought out much more social interactions when I was younger. Now the mere thought of going to a party where I, I know just like a couple of people is like ridiculously stressful. And I wouldn't do it. I would just say, no, thank you. So for 503, we've seen, you know, with many adult bears, their playfulness and tolerant nature might wane as they mature into a full grown adult. 503 is almost nine years old, so he's not full grown yet. His whole life so far has been available uh, for us to witness on the bear camps. And I think with him, we have a remarkable opportunity to carefully observe how an individual bear uh, can change their social nature over the course of their life. Uh, so Kim, while 503 provides you know, such a, a fantastic example, he's not the only one. As a group, which bears are most likely to, dis to display a, uh, a, social, uh, a social nature? Well, as you mentioned, younger bears. <laughs> they tend to be a little bit more social. So I love watching the cubs. I mean, who, who doesn't, right? <laughs> um, what you notice with these families of multiple cubs is there are some individuals who tend to be more playful than others. Every now and then you may see a cub who always seems to be hiding behind mom um, or whether these bears are timid around just people or it's a personality quality in itself is hard to say but we do see you know the little ones being the most playful of the bunch the most social um they're still learning and you know they're not food driven yet they're just having fun and learning and enjoying life our next personality trait is boldness and that's an interesting one to consider because because boldness uh, in the context of animal personalities can be defined as a response to a perceived risk. And that can be contrasted with shyness, for example. So when I'm thinking about this, um, immediately the bear that popped into mind is 164. Uh, over the last couple of years, bear 164 to me has been especially bold. Not only did he invent a new fishing spot for himself at the base of Brooks Falls, but he's fished there in close proximity to some of the most dominant bears on the river. And this is a risky thing to do. It's a bold move. He's faced the consequences of that several times, either by being displaced or having his fish stolen. But he's found a lot of success there too. <laughs> and this is the perfect clip to uh, to illustrate that. Um, you know, eight five six trying to push him out of the way, and he got pushed out of the way. But he also caught a fish at the same time. So if he were too shy to approach, you know, the base of the falls, he would not have discovered this lucrative fishing spot. And Kim, you've been watching a mother bear who also seems to be bold in her behaviors this year. Yeah, yeah. So on the river these past couple of weeks, I've been seeing 132 and her cubs, um, and they've been pirating fish from many different bears, um, many, um, many groups, many, many family groups, including um, 910. And also I saw 132 pirate a fish from one grazer at her cubs, which I thought was very bold of her. Um, in this case, boldness would be seen as a risk versus reward. Um, we see 132 taking larger risks as she tends to her family's needs. So she's out there making rounds and doing what she has to do to make sure her family survives. But, you know, she's taking these risks that other bears may not be. And finally, our last uh, pers main personality trait that we'll talk about is activity. Uh, and that's in contrast to energy conservation. Uh, this is a tendency towards movement. You know, some bears seem like they enjoy moving their bodies, even if as a species, they really tend to lean towards energy conservation. Uh, Kim, if there's one bear that exists on the far end of this activity spectrum, toward the end of the energy conservation side of that. I think this is, you have to, we have to talk about Otis. Yeah, I feel like everybody at home is saying it together with me right now. Yeah, it's Otis. <laughs> um, the amount of energy, you know, one expends is a very common personality trait we see in bears. <laughs> Here we see Otis, for example, one of the most chill bears we see fishing out there. Half the time it looks like he 
Jesus. <laughs> and then, you know, all of a sudden we see him pull a fish out of the water with his claws. And this patience that he shows is just, it's incredible. There, there he is with his fish. <laughs> he also doesn't um, expend energy in tiffs with other bears if he doesn't have to. Like just last week, I saw one two eight -er enter Otis's office and try to remove him. And, and he just, <laughs> it's funny because you see his face turn the other way and it looks like he was just telling her, hey, I'm not going to deal with this today. Of course, I don't know what the bears are thinking, but yeah, he doesn't seem to expend more energy than he has to out there. He's all about efficiency. And those are our, you know, the, the five, or I shouldn't say our, but um, five main personality traits of non-human animals that biologists have identified who've been studying uh, this aspect of their world. And those again are aggressiveness, exploratory tendencies, sociability, boldness, and activity. So those are all the sort of common personality traits that I think you'll be able to see in each one of the bears that we watch. But those aren't the only traits. You know, for example, an additional trait that I can think of is innovation. Uh, 164 showed that. We talked about him before, his ability uh, to invent a fishing spot at the base of Brooks Falls. 903, in this clip here, hunting gulls, is innovative in a way too. He's like the one bear in recent memory, at least, that has learned and discovered the ability to hunt gulls. He started doing this in 2020, and he's continued this behavior off and on since then. In fact, Ranger saw him catch a gull downstream of Brooks Falls within the last couple of weeks or so. Uh, although, and I don't know this for sure, Kim, but I think he probably discovered this behavior on his own. Uh, and maybe that goes to uh, towards a little bit of the boldness end of the spectrum for him trying uh, new things. Uh, many people have speculated that one to a grazer is his mother. Uh, and grazer's not known to be a gull hunter. So I think this is certainly a, uh, a personality trait uh, that he discovered maybe on his own, but it could have something to do with maybe his prior experiences with mother. That's something that we don't really know. It'd be really hard to measure scientifically. Uh, but I encourage you know everyone at home to watch for these personality traits and maybe others as well, and take note how the bears express them. All of this really leads one to wonder, Kim, are these traits inherited, inherited or are they learned? Uh, from what we've seen, there seems to be evidence for both, but from what I, I also understand, no one really knows. Right, yeah. So, I mean, without DNA testing, we can't really trace any similarities to paternal lines. But, you know, when we go out there to the river and we watch the bears, we do see the mirroring behaviors of their mothers and, you know, the societies that they live in as well. So, like humans, I imagine it is more of a learned quality, kind of through trial and error. Um, they adapt to just different stimuli that they experience over their lifetime and experiences like positive ones, like food acquisitions or negative outcomes, such as interactions with more dominant bears. These all give them opportunity to alter their approach going further. So do bears inherit their personalities? Like the saying, you know, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. Like, are we going to see one to eight grazers offspring possess her same assertiveness on the river? Are we going to see Holly's recently emancipated offspring show a similarly relaxed demeanor like Holly does, like Holly shows? Though genetics play a part in personality, it's hard to ascertain exactly how it will reveal itself in individual bears. Um, as you mentioned, you know, if 128 is um, 903 uh, goalies, mom, you know, they have very different <laughs> foraging habits. Um, but this is all something, you know, we get to look forward to observing in the next couple years as we watch cubs grow. We just don't have the answers yet. Um, so, you know, though these bears, they sometimes have similarities, they are also very individualistic creatures and they have their own set of persons. Um, what, what do you think are some advantages of a diverse bear population? Well, at Brooks Falls, I think one of the main examples is that many bears can just fit into a small area. Um, you know, as a learned culture that focuses on salmon, I mean, that enhances their survival. 
Uh, but it's the personalities of these individual bears and their individualistic nature that really allows them to thrive in this location. No two bears behave in the exact same way. No two bears completely overlap in their fishing strategies or locations. Uh, for example, there are few adult female bears with cubs who fish the lip of the falls. Um, or this year, I guess there are a few. There's like number 909, number 910, 128 grazer, but you don't find 909 and 910 fishing in the far pool like you will grazer. So again, not all, not every bear will fish in the exact same way. There's really no one right way to do it. So you'll find bears that are also good at sharing space with other bears. And maybe those uh, that offers more opportunities uh, for them to nudge their way into fishing spots. While a more sh is more likely to wait their turn uh, downstream or even avoid the area. And that's not necessarily the wrong way to do it. That's just a different strategy. And it, you know, just depending on the circumstances, it could be a more effective one um, in the future if they need to avoid other bears in a certain situation, or um, you know, if somehow people became more aggressive in the area, those sorts of things. Uh, bears, through their personalities and learned experiences, they partition themselves within a shared landscape. And that allows far more bears to utilize Brooks River than if they all sought salmon in the same way. On a larger scale, Kim, we see this partitioning happening across Katmai's entire landscape. Yeah. So, you know, many bears can fill many niches on the landscape. We see bears on the coast with a fuller diet of berries and vegetation. And these bears, they're really quite healthy looking as well, even without the salmon in their diet. This is great um, because it means there's enough ingenuity and resources to go around for all of the animals because, well, imagine for a second if they were all vying for a limited resource, the pop would dwindle dramatically. We also see coastal bears taking advantage of other resources like hunting otters and seals, and they also forage for clams. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Mike, um, 903 goalie, he, innovation is key with, with these bears. Um, the greater the fitness of bears, the more resilient they become. If push comes to shove and all of these resources here disappeared for whatever reason, whether from climate change or something else, we would likely see bears like 903 being the survivors because of this more exploratory personality trait that he possesses. So, but outside of these natural threats to the diversity of bears, you know, they also face some human related conflicts as well. It's important for us to know what role we also play in the survival of these wild creatures. Mike, do you do you want to take the lead on this one? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, because there's a, there was a really interesting study that came out of um, uh, or it was based on a population of bears in southwest Alberta. It was published in 2016, and that study paired trends in bear and human conflicts in that region with DNA analysis to confirm parentage of the bears. And they found almost all grizzly bears that targeted human foods in that area or caused property damage or killed livestock. So behaviors that are considered conflict behaviors. Those bears had mothers with a known history of bear and human conflict. So offspring of mothers with so-called conflict behaviors, they were much, much more likely to be involved in conflict behaviors themselves as independent bears. While offspring from mothers without that history were not likely to be involved in incidents of bear and human conflict. And also remember that, you know, uh, it takes, you know, a male and a female bear to make cubs, right? Uh, so male bears, they play no role in raising offspring. I think this was a good opportunity for the researchers to really uh, take a look at and see if there is any genetic link with uh, those, those conflict behaviors. Uh, because male bears, their role in producing offspring is strictly genetic. And the DNA analysis was able to confirm the fathers of 119 bears in that area, but there was no relationship between a father's conflict history with people and the behavior of his offspring. So in other words, the researchers found no evidence of a sex-linked gene that would promote bear and human conflict through the paternal line. And they noted that if conflict between bears and people were an inherited behavior, then they should have found a significant relationship between parental behavior uh, or, or paternal behavior, excuse me, to be more specific the, through the male line and offspring behavior, but there wasn't anything like that. The only measurable influence was the behavior of the mother bear, underscoring really how important learned behavior is for cubs. And Kim, have you, as you've mentioned before, 
evidence of social learning through the maternal line has led to a long history of bear and human conflicts in that park that you used to work at, Yosemite. Yeah, I mean, as you were just mentioning, yeah, bears are likely to target human foods if this is what they were taught by mom. And the studies show it that food condition um, cells um, are the ones that like if they are not reconditioned, they will pass these on to their offspring. So it doesn't depend on what a cell did in the past, but what she teaches her offspring in the present. Um, so bears, you know, they're opportunists and poorly stored food can be an easy access to calories. In my earlier years at Yosemite, it was not uncommon for bears to break into cars and peeling them open kind of like just like a regular can. <laughs> um, so these maladaptive habits, they may be beneficial for bears in the short term while they're like calorie loading on fattier human foods, but they can be dangerous for both themselves and for their future generations. Bears that have received food from humans are often seen walking more along roadsides, they're more aggressive, they get into more conflicts with humans. So studies of bear relo relocations in the Sierras show that these are often unsuccessful as bears, they just, they navigate their way back to the food source or they find a new town and they cause the same nuisances. So we see this happening in more locations than just in the Sierras. And if we don't start protecting these bears from you know our messy habits, we're impacting their survival. Um, we don't know what sort of bear culture we might lose if bears keep dying because of our influence and our inability to store our foods properly. Yeah, we probably already have, unfortunately. You can think of, you know, just um, going back to California, for example, grizzly bears used to live across most of California. They probably lived at high densities along the coast of of California and were feeding on things like acorns and marine mammal carcasses. And that's just disappeared. There are no more, more grizzly bears in California right now. And even if there was space for them in that landscape today, you know, if you brought a bear back, it would be very difficult for them to make us be established coastal uh, culture. Uh, and not all behaviors in bears and all cultures are widespread. Um, you know, there's seal hunting bears in Katmai on the Pacific side of the park. Uh, that and that's just like a small subset of bears um, that have learned how to do that it's not a widespread behavior the moth eating bears in yellowstone are also another great example uh, so those are behaviors and um in sort of like many cultures that are expressed by relatively few bears and the home ranges that of the grizzlies in yellowstone that feed on moths uh, overlap with a lot of bears who don't feed on moths so uh, it's it's, you know, again, a, a great example of how those things are passed down from mother to cub and beyond. It would be, you know, possible to lose those subcultures and larger cultures fairly easily with the disappearance of maybe just a few bears, uh, female bears specifically, who teach their cubs how to forage in those ways. So, uh, for example, another culturally inherited behavior occurs in Yellowstone, where only a small proportion of grizzlies feed on spawning cutthroat trout on tributaries of Yellowstone Lake. But the, the illegal introduction of lake trout in Yellowstone uh, caused the cutthroat trout population to crash. And that really disrupted the culture of fishing bears that formerly sought trout in large numbers. Uh, and we definitely wanna get to a few viewer questions here in just a moment or so. I know there's a ton. Thanks for everyone who submitted those in advance. We're not gonna have time to get to them all, unfortunately, Kim. But before we, you know, we get to those, I just had like one, uh, final thought, really. And this is uh, a big question that I'm always playing around with in my mind. And, and that is, what can we do to ensure that bear culture and personality remains an advantage for bears rather than become maladaptive? And we've given examples of how that can be mal maladaptive. Uh, targeting human foods, as Kim mentioned, is profitable for bears in the short term, but largely detrimental in the long term because those bears uh, that seek human foods often become a danger to people and they're unfortunately euthanized. Uh, to protect bear cultures and their uniqueness and unique personalities, uh, we need to work to reduce temptations that lead bears into conflict with people. That's extraordinarily important. This is perhaps even 
more necessary outside of national parks where bears are often not afforded the same protections or tolerance as inside of parks. So check with your state or provincial wildlife agency to see where bears live. You might be surprised by how extensive their range is, especially black bears in North America. And if you travel, you live, or you work in bear country, then be sure to store your food, including your pet food and bird seeds securely. Work to help your neighbors understand bear behavior and motivations and support organizations that work to conserve bears and help people coexist with them. Many um, organizations like that exist, but a few that I find reputable are Bear Smart Society, the Bear Trust International, and the Katmai Conservancy. And finally, support scientific efforts, um, either through public land management agencies or universities, or whatever it happens to be, scientific efforts that study animal culture and personalities. Because it's really becoming increasingly clear that individual animals have large influence on the survival of populations. This this was a field of study that was long ignored or stigmatized. But if I may reverse a commonly used metaphor, in doing so, we're not able to see trees within the forest. If we, if we study animal uh, culture and personality, we protect animal culture and personality, then we'll add new layers of understanding of the creatures that we share the world with, and we'll have a better idea of how to protect them. So in conclusion, Individual and cultural differences help brown bears utilize their intelligence, their individuality, their adaptability to survive across a wide swath of earth. And Katmai's wild landscape, it's rich with salmon, has allowed bears to thrive through the development and expression of unique culture, as well as a full range of ursine personalities. grab uh, a few audience questions. I may have cut out there, but um, yeah, let's, uh, if we have time and you're willing to stick around, let's try to get to a few of those questions. Yeah, let's check them out. All right. Yeah, so thanks everyone who submitted questions. Um, we're not gonna be able to get to them all, so I apologize for that. Uh, you know, one of the things, Kim, that's always really interesting is how certain bears are tolerant of other certain bears, maybe not others. Um, and as somebody was asking about number 164, who's also nicknamed by the cam viewers as Bucky Dent. Um, sometimes they'll call him a shower bear because he's like standing underneath the waterfall, getting a shower all the time. So somebody was wondering, why do most bears seem so tolerant of Bucky Dent, AKA shower bear or AKA 164 in that fishing location directly under the lip? I think they might recognize that he's not, you know, a big threat to their fishing position or their level of dominance. Uh, but what do you what do you think about that? You know, it's funny because I I've been asking myself that question as well while watching him down there in that area because he's he is pretty much sandwiched by you know some very skilled fishers on either side of him, both in the jacuzzi and both on the lip. But I mean, he doesn't seem to have a very um, aggressive nature to him. He seems to just sit there and kind of mind his own business. So as we're talking about, you know, personality earlier on the spectrum, um, he may be bold, but he doesn't seem extremely aggressive. So as you were saying, you know, the other bears may not see him as a threat. He just doesn't have that disposition about him. So they just kind of let him be. <laughs> And I think that might be the case for Otis too. Um, Otis is, he's not a small bear at all, but it seems like a lot of bears will cut him a little bit of a break. I think they're recognizing that, you know, he is a large bear, but he's unlikely to maybe try to displace them from uh, a fishing spot, for example. So they kind of like, oh yeah, that's that, that old dude. He's, he's cool. We'll just let him be for the moment. I mean, of course, there's always exceptions to this, but, um, you know, I think that what we've talked about with 164 also applies to other bears like like Otis. Uh, one question that we got, you know, in advance, and it was it's uh, applicable to this chat, was wondering about um, personalities and how they're influenced by their mothers. We talked a little bit about this during the main portion of our broadcast, but maybe we can speculate just a little bit about some specific bears that this person is um, asking about. Um, our Somebody was wondering, are the personalities of bears influenced by their mothers, for example? Or do 
Razor's now adult offspring behave in similar ways to her? Uh, or is 503 mellow because he was partially raised by Holly? Uh, real quick, Kim, do you want to recap maybe how, what we know and what we don't know about how personality is influenced um, you know, by a mother bear? And then maybe I can speculate on those specific bears. Yeah, so, I mean, personality is influenced by watching, you know, mothers. I think it's mostly all learned. It could be possibly genetic. Um, we, we don't really have any evidence to show how it might be um, passed down genetically from a mother to her offspring. Um, so just, again, being part of like a culture is also going to influence their actions as well. So seeing what the other bears are doing in the river around them, um, they might take on some uh, behaviors from them as well. Um, but yeah, they do look to their moms to teach them I would say some basic principles of how to act and they like uh, mimic her, you know, fishing styles as well. Yeah, it's, I think this is going to be one of those, one of those things that maybe we can tease out over, you know, years and years of watching bears on the bear cams because formerly, you know, this experience was just limited to like biologists and rangers who stayed at Brooks River all summer, but we have this hive mind now of millions of people around the world watching the bears. So I think we can be, we can gain some really interesting insights on the behaviors of these animals. It's possible that I, I you know, a, a cub might see mom like grazer beating up on other bears and be like, you know what, that strategy works. I think I'm <laughs> going to try that in the future. We don't know that for sure. Uh, but you know, that's, that's a possibility. Um, Holly was, you know, she's generally a pretty mellow bear. Um, and, you know, she was very tolerant um, in adopting 503. Maybe that's led a little bit to his, um, you know, more social side that we've seen expressed recently. I'm not really sure because 503's biological mo mother, number 402, she's not one of those mother bears that you would call like playful or tolerant of other bears. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a mixed bag. And I don't think we're really gonna know um, for sure. Uh, we have, uh, we'll actually, since there are so many questions, we'll try to stick around just a couple of extra minutes to answer a few extra ones. So again, thanks for everyone who has submitted um, questions so far. One of the more recently submitted questions, though, was about Otis, of course. Um, we can not, probably not talk too much about Otis since he is such a, a favorite bear. Um, but somebody was wondering, has Otis always had his present personality? He seems to be a, of an optimal <laughs> intelligence in a hostile environment and and otis um actually uh kim you might remember when uh, i was talking with ranger roy wood uh, during our 10th anniversary live chat event last um on, or on the 25th of july and that was over a week ago now but um roy and i were talking about how otis has always seemed old to us even when he was like in his his mid-teens he always seemed like just like a really old bear uh, so I do think that his personality, uh, at least within my time, I really haven't seen that changed. He's always been extremely patient uh, and, and done pretty well um, for himself through that manner. He hasn't really been aggressive uh, either. So I do think that Otis um, overall has been, uh, you know, his personality, I should say, has been uh, pretty, uh, pretty, pretty typical. Um, for, for him, at least. We haven't really seen that change. So if you're just watching the bear cams for the first time this year and you've got to know Otis, yeah, that's often how he behaved many uh, years ago. Uh, uh, interesting question here, Kim, too, about uh, about bears and their sociability. Uh, how might the sociability... Oh, sorry, Kim. Did my did my uh, my audio drop there for just a little bit? Hey, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Here. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's move on. To, you know, we'll we'll try to get to one or two more questions here. Um, somebody was wondering how might sociability benefit an individual bear or the ecosystem. So you know, from what you've been observing on the river this year, what what advantage does being social really bring some of those younger bears? Well, um, I mean. You know, 
again, these bears, they're, they're all congregating in this, in this small area for the food source. And being a more sociable bear could benefit them by, you know, like perhaps not appearing as much of as a threat to other bears and like not being as scared, not being afraid of getting closer to bears. Um, it might allow them to receive scraps from a bear. Um, you know, just again, I think it's about that proximity that they are able to gain um, to other bears and other resources because of their sociability. Um, as we were talking about some other bears um, like uh, <laughs> like Bucky Dent who you know, is, is in the shower and maybe he's not considered a threat. Perhaps also a social bear is also not considered a threat. And as far as like the ecosystem goes, I think the social nature of bears can certainly um, help with that uh, or, or expand or benefit ecosystem processes in a place where you have a really rich food resource like salmon and you have, you know, short growing seasons and, you know, uh, waters that aren't really rich in nutrients bears are vectors that disperse salmon nutrients throughout the ecosystem so they do that by dragging carcasses up onto the land they do that by urinating on the land after they've eaten salmon they do that by pooping across the landscape and so they're spreading basically fertilizer all over the place and uh, you know if, if more bears are feeding on salmon then that allows more salmon nutrients to be dispersed into terrestrial and freshwater environments so I definitely think there could be like a, a benefit to the ecosystem from the social nature of bears. Uh, and last question that we'll get here today, again, thanks to everyone who has submitted questions. We apologize for not having the time to answer them all, but this is also, this is also a really fascinating question to consider. And I do think it has, it's very applicable to bear culture. Uh, somebody was asking, is there any way of knowing how long bears have been coming to eat the salmon at Katmai? Uh, I assume for decades, maybe much, much longer. So there's kind of like two parts to this answer. Um, the first part is, you know, when bears first inhabited this area, when did that happen? Were salmon around at the time? Probably yes. So I suspect that bears were fishing for salmon um, as soon as salmon were available in this area and bears were inhabiting this area. So at the end of the last ice age, where Kim is standing right now, um, if you were to be there, you know, 20,000 years ago, it would have been covered by ice, you know, several, you know, maybe a couple thousand feet of ice or something like that. So it wouldn't, wouldn't have been inhabitable, inhabitable to, be, to bears then. But other places in like the, the, what is currently the Bering Sea, that's Beringia, that would have been perhaps occupied by salmon. And bears could have been, uh, you know, fishing for salmon there. And then also, Kim, there's this interesting uh, aspect of how there weren't many bears utilizing the Brooks River area when Katmai National Monument was sort of expanded to include Brooks River in 1931. And then after Brooks Lodge was established within the National Monument in the 1950s, there were reports of hardly any bears in the area. So we've seen bears over time learn and establish like this, this salmon centered culture specifically at Brooks Falls, even though they were doing it throughout the park, but it wasn't something that people 60 years ago could go to, to Brooks River and expect to see. Yeah, as you were saying, the, the bears didn't always gravitate towards this area for their food resource. We've seen the numbers, you know, increase quite a lot over the last couple of decades. Um, and, you know, as the salmon run is doing very well, we, we see a lot of bears come here. Um, oh, and I see a bear right now too. <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's really been quite a shift here at Brooks River, um, you know, as the landscape changes, so do the benefits and resources for other animals. And I'm sure as more of these bears come to this area, it also changes the ecosystem itself as well. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to uh, consider the the cultural shift with the bears fishing at Brooks Falls and how they've learned to tolerate people because we have, um, you know, in a sense, learned to tolerate them, and that was something that maybe didn't happen early in the the history of of Brooks Lodge. Uh, there just weren't a lot of bears around and those bears were really weirded out by people because of the you know some of their past experiences um and, and generational sort of like knowledge of those past experiences as well and, and maybe ne negative interactions that they had with people overall so it's changing it's always going to change um 
Kim, this has been a really great conversation. I've had fun with it. And um, I hope everyone, you know, is, is going to go home, uh, you know, thinking more about the cultures of bears, you know, at Katmai and maybe also in their, their region. Absolutely. Thank you for having me today. And everybody, if you're looking for something to do, there have been bears just running around the lower river this entire time, this entire hour. So check out the webcams too. <laughs> I know that can be quite distracting when you're standing there trying to speak to a dead eye <laughs> of a camera <laughs> and there are bears running around you. So thanks for thanks for pushing through yeah. that. Um, and my, my co-host today was uh, park ranger Kim Grossman from Katmai National Park. My name is Mike Miller with Explore.org. Thanks for watching today. And as we like to say at Explore.org, never stop learning. Thank you.